All right, settle down. This is the far more popular side of the room today for some reason. I don't know why that is. I, mean, I need to spend more time over here with the people who are brave enough to sit on the other side of the room. So um, it's nice to be back. Did you guys enjoy movie week? Yeah. I heard Jing Hao did a nice job of handling you guys while I was gone, so that's nice. Um, so we're done with the processor. It's finished. That's the first big unit of this class, and it's over. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start talking about another component of the system. It's quite a bit different than the processor. We're going to start talking about RAM, or random access memory. Um, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, OK. Yeah, everybody gets it now. Um, so and, and you know, RAM is, it's interesting because it's different in certain ways than the CPU, but some of the techniques that the operating system uses to multiplex the resource and to create abstractions around it are quite similar. Some are different, right? So this is a good case study, um, and it'll, you know, there'll be, you'll, you guys will sort of notice parallels with what we did with the CPU, and there'll be some differences as well, okay? So today we're going to talk, uh, we're going to pretty much continue on with the same format. So we're going to start with the sort of abstraction, and then well, actually, I guess with the CPU, we didn't do that. We started at the bottom. Here, we're going to start by talking about the abstraction that we're going to try to provide um, and talk about how great it is. And then we're going to work out all sort of the interesting, difficult details with providing that abstraction throughout the next few weeks. Um, and OK, so you guys have two weeks left to finish assignment two. Less than two weeks, actually, like 12 days or something. But, um, the, um, the videos from while I was gone, and I can see people coming to office hours and stuff like that, so that's great. Uh, hopefully people are, how many people have started assignment two? All right, good. This is, this is great. Like last year, no one did assignment two until like the last week of class, so we're making progress. Maybe we can just stop class right at spring break and then just take the rest of the semester off. Um, all right, so the, the last, so I added the videos from last year to the playlist, so everything's in sort of the same place for you guys uh, that you were asked to watch. Um, and the videos from while I was away, including recitation and the sessions that Jing Hao held, will be posted today or tomorrow once I get around to putting them on YouTube. Um, so this is also the time of the semester where um, your, your partnership may be struggling or may be challenged, right? These, when the assignments get difficult, people frequently start to find out that you know, the partnership that they were hoping would work out isn't working out as well. So if that's you, please come talk to us sooner rather than later. We would rather find out about uh, this kind of issue. I mean, certainly if your partner has like resigned the class or something, that is a pretty obvious solution to it. But if you're struggling with your partner, if you're feeling like they're not pulling their weight, if they're doing too much, they're not giving you a chance to write any of the code or whatever, um, you know, please come talk to us because th those are issues that we want to be able to address up front, right? If you come to us a month from now, um, you know, uh, with these sort of issues when, when they've really gotten bad and sort of have been exacerbated by the stress of doing these assignments, then they're much more difficult to sort of untangle. So if you feel like you're having some partner issues, please come talk to the core staff, come talk to me, uh, and we'll try to work those out amicably. And if not, you guys can sort of go off in your separate ways, and, and sometimes that's a better solution than continuing to try to work together, okay? All right, so now that we're, the last sort of piece we talked about, and hopefully people watched the videos about last week, was process scheduling. So any questions about thread scheduling before we go on to the next unit? And I'll spend a little more time here than usual because I was gone last week, and I don't know. How many people watched the videos? Be honest. OK, yeah, well, the rest of you, it, that stuff will be on the exam. So I would suggest that you watch it at some point. Uh, OK. What's that? BFS. Yeah, and you should watch the BFS lecture, because that's a fun <laughs> one. Um, all right, so what is scheduling? Review time. What is red scheduling? Yeah, Damien. Choosing the next, choosing the next thread yeah, it's the process of choosing the next thread, or threads, if I have a multi-core CPU. But it's usually, we can think of it, reduce it to a single core problem. I have a core that's available, either because I've stopped the thread that was running, or because uh, that thread has made some sort of blocking call. It can no longer continue to run. And I need to allocate that, that core to a new thread. So choosing which of the threads that are ready to run is actually going to be able to use the CPU to give time. All right? Why does the operating system schedule threads? And in general, why is scheduling policy important? 
I'm going to ignore the front of the room today. Let's go back. Yeah. To give the uh, illusion of concurrency. Well, that's, that's something that, ah, oh, is that for me? Ah, ooh. <laughs> You're running. I thought you had. <laughs> Please take this sub. Um, <laughs> the okay, so that's maybe more like the, the the what I can do with with scheduling. But in particular, why does the operating system have to schedule threads? All right, you're far enough back. Because we have more threads than cores, right? So I I need to you know if I had fewer threads than cores, I wouldn't have a scheduling problem to solve. But why else does the operating system do this? Yeah. Yeah, but why have, you know, why have I trusted, well, maybe I'm starting to answer that question. Yeah, so I, I want to be fair to all threads. I want all threads to continue to make progress. Yeah. Yeah, so now we're getting more into policy, right? So certainly one reason is that I, I need to multiplex the CPU, right? This is a resource that I can't just hand each thread its own core, right? But also remember, the kernel is in charge of doing this, right? The kernel is what runs when a thread stops for, you know, either because it's made up some sort of system call or because the timer on just fired, right? So this is kernel policy, and it's the kernel's job to make sure that this happens uh, efficiently, right? I've, I've hinted at this several times already, but when do I get a chance to make a scheduling decision? When do I have the opportunity to stop a thread from running? Rob Swami. When does Maybe. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, so I guess that's, that's a fair answer, actually. So whenever there's an interrupt, I have an opportunity to stop a threat, right? Because the, the kernel has run, right? So if that can be a timer run up, which I'm going to set up periodically to make sure I have chances to stop threads. It, what else can happen that can cause the kernel to be able to make a scheduling decision? Paul. I could have a timer interrupt, or what could happen? In the timer interrupt, I'm going to take a thread that was able to continue running and stop it from running so that I can do something else with the CPU. There's also a case where the thread cannot continue to run. Why not? Assume it. Well, what's that falls in the general category of what? Yeah. Yeah, it's made a blocking system call, right? It's waiting for something slow to happen, right? And the other one we didn't get to is when a thread voluntarily gives up these. So if a thread makes a blocking system call and can't continue to run until something has happened, the buffer that it asked me to fill is full, right? When the thread exits, of course, forgot that one. And when the kernel decides the thread has run long enough and implements that with the timer. Yeah, Matt. I just want to make sure you said it doesn't necessarily have to be a blocking system call. That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. All right. So a blocking system call, let's put it this way. A blocking system call forces the kernel to make a scheduling decision. A non-blocking system call allows the kernel to make a scheduling decision because the kernel does run. Right? It, and it, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. It's a good question. I should have Guru find this out since he's my resident expert on Linux now. It would, it would be interesting to find out whether a non-blocking system call on Linux ever will trigger this scheduler. Will a non-blocking system call ever cause that that process, that task to block, or, or that task to be descheduled? Right. That would be interesting. Mm, okay. Okay. We'll come back to this. I'm, I'm curious about this, right? Because it, it would it would wouldn't surprise me if it doesn't. But. All right. So what are the what are the, some of the goals that we had when we were looking at schedulers, right? What were some of the competing objectives that schedulers were trying to, you know, what's What's one? Avoid starvation. Yeah, avoid starvation. Okay, so that's like the minimum case, right? I don't want to starve anybody, right? When I think about how to allocate resources on the machine, what else might I be trying to accomplish? Let's say I have a lot of work to do, right? What would I like? What would the scheduler like to, to make sure happens? Yeah, James. Throughput. Yeah, so I want to make sure a lot's getting done, and frequently that means what? I can ask you just leading questions. You guys are so persistent up here in the front of the room. That's why you guys are up here. Yeah. 
what, what, what am I trying, well, what is scheduling trying to accomplish, right? What am I trying to do? Yeah, I want, I want threads to make a lot of progress. Frequently that involves, whoops, oh. okay, well that's another thing, right? So <laughs> I might want to meet deadlines, right? What kind of deadlines am I talking about here? What's an example of a deadline? I mean, deadline's a very abstract term, right? What's an example of a deadline that you guys might notice on your computer systems? Yeah? An example that you have with the, the mouse, expecting the mouse pointer to do for a person. Yeah, sort of interactive work, right? It's, it, particularly when I paint. Right? When, when you click on something, for example, you click on a menu, there's some computation that has to go on before I can draw whatever pane that is. That's an example of a deadline. If that menu doesn't appear for a long period of time, you start to interpret that as the, as the system being slow or the interface being difficult to use. Right? And then and the, the question of throughput frequently comes down to how completely can I engage all the resources on the system? So I've got a bunch of things to do, and, and to, you know, depending on what those are, that may not require uh, utilizing all the resources, but to the degree those tasks need resources, I want to keep everything busy at once, right? I want to have high utilization of all the resources on my system. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, and we talked about how deadlines on human-facing systems typically tend to win over throughput. Why is that? Yeah. Yeah, so your time is more valuable for a computer, and you also notice this, right? This is what you notice. You don't necessarily notice that the background tasks take a little bit longer to complete, but you notice that the foreground task is looking laggy and, and the interface is locking up and things like that, right? Um, and then the other thing about schedulers, right, and this is something that you guys, if you watched Friday's video you saw me um, talk about, is this idea of performance. So. If the process of choosing the next thread to run itself starts to consume so much time that no threads can, un threads can actually make progress, then you have a problem, right? So schedulers have to be fast. Because the, ske the, the time it takes to schedule a thread is essentially just completely wasted, right? Nobody notices that their scheduler is doing a great job or whatever. It's just the scheduler's job is to stay out of the way and try to make sure that it gives other threads as much time to run, right? And this is something that was addressed in sort of several generations of the Linux scheduler by improving its performance. So it takes a constant amount of time to choose the next thread regardless of how many threads are actually ready to run on the system. So that's pretty cool. All right. Um, two examples of threads that don't use, sorry, two examples of schedulers that don't use any information about the threads on the system. Very simple, yeah. Random. Random, okay. What's random's best friend? Yeah. Round robin. Round robin, yeah. These are the canonical ones. Um, so on, on, in Wednesday's video, we talked about some information we might want to know about the thread that we're about to execute. What are some examples of things, if we could predict the future, if we could implement this Oracle scheduler, right? Um, what would we like to know about the near future of the thread? Yeah. How long is it going to run? Yeah, how long is it going to run before it blocks, right? So that's one thing. Um, what else? Yeah. Whether it's an interactive Yeah, is this thread actually doing some sort of interactive work, right? Is it painting to the screen? Is the user going to know? Um, will it block, right? This is sort of related to how long is it going to use the CPU. Um, what else? One more thing. Yeah. How long will it wait? Yeah, once it hits a wait queue, once it's waiting for something, how long is that request going to take? Right? In certain cases, that last thing could be entirely unpredictable. Give me an example of a, a case where the operating system would have really no way to actually predict how long a certain thread would block. What would be the type of thing that you could block for and it might take a completely unpredictable amount of time? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a great one. <laughs> yeah, you wandered off, man. Like, went to get a sandwich. You know, this computer's sitting there. Like, I don't know where this guy is. Yeah, that's a good one. It's not what I was thinking of, actually. But that's, that, that's even better than what I was thinking. I was thinking of, like, network usage, right? You know, but <laughs> that's even better. Um, what, what's an example of a type of, uh, a type of weight that might be more predictable in certain cases? Yeah. Like when you're doing something like actually like compressing a file? Yeah, compressing a file consists of this activity, but doesn't necessarily encompass it entirely. Yeah. Uh, file access. Yeah, disk usage, right? 
I mean, there's usually some bounds on how long those operations take, right? We'll talk more about, you know, disks in the second, sort of third half of the class, but um, <laughs> the, uh, the disk definitely is more predictable than network and certainly more predictable than you, right, when you went to get a sandwich. All right, so um, now, Unfortunately, we can't predict the future. If you guys could predict the future, I would hope you would do something more interesting than implement a scheduler. You know? <laughs> like, tell us, I don't know, tell us what's going to happen in the future, right? And then make a lot of money. That's probably what you guys would do, right? Maybe not in that order. Um, so instead of predicting the future, future we do what? Use the past. Use the past. Use the past. Everyone say this together. Usually I do this in class. And I miss that chance. Ready? Use the past to predict the future. This happens over and over and over again especially when we start talking about memory, right? We use the past to predict the future. In the near past, right, we figure that a thread's going to continue to do what it's been doing. Um, what's an example of a schedule that we looked at that does just that? Really the only one we looked at that just this. What about good old MLFQ, those multi-level feedback cues, right? And, and, and what, what aspect of the past does MLFQ use to predict the future? Yeah, Matt. Whether or not um, you can need a blocking call or whether you didn't like, time or else it was something Yeah, so it's essentially, you know, if, if the last time you ran, you blocked quickly, yeah. the next time you run, you're going to block quickly. And so when I'm looking for threads to run, if I run you, you're only going to occupy the CPU for a short period of time, right? Assuming that you did, again, what you did last time, right? All right, finally, just a little, uh, how many people watch Friday's video? Okay, so who's Ingo Molnar? What, what does he do? Does, I don't know if he still does this. I should make sure these slides are still up to date. The last time I checked, Ingo Molnar was doing what? Yeah. Yeah, he was, the, he was the maintainer of the Linux scheduling subsystem, right? Is that still true? Oh, goody. Okay, yeah. <laughs> He's been doing it for a while. I don't know. Who knows? Um, who is Khan Kalivas? I hope I, I'm hope i saying it. Someone, like, disliked this video on YouTube. I'm wondering. <laughs> I'm wondering. <laughs> what's there not to like? I mean, it might be boring, but why did you watch it? I mean, you knew what it was about. What did you think it was interesting? Um, uh, maybe I'm pronouncing his name wrong. Maybe that's why they didn't like it. Uh, who is Khan Kalibas? Yeah, Doug. Uh, he was a Linux hacker who came up with the scheduling system of rotating staircase. Yeah, so, and, and, and actually his day job, and again, I don't know if this is still true, but at least the time he was working on Linux, he was an Australian anesthetist, which is like <laughs> a sweet collection of words that have lots, has lots of A's in them. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, while he wasn't like putting people to sleep for surgery, maybe while, maybe during surgery he was working on it. Who knows? At least conceptually. I don't know what anesthetists do during surgery. It's not that interesting, right? I mean, you know, you're just standing there watching the guy sleep. Um, so he had some free time. He decided to work on Linux kernel scheduling. Kind of interesting uh, thing. So, all right. And now, now we're, I think we're bringing these questions closer and closer to the front of the room, unfortunately. Um, so uh, the, to, to the rotating staircase uh, s deadline scheduler, assuming we have a rotating staircase deadline scheduler with a 5 millisecond quantum and 10 levels, um, if a thread starts in the highest priority level, which levels is it allowed to run in? Yeah, all of them, right? <coughs> What about a thread that starts at priority five? Which ones can it run in? Yeah, yeah, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay. Um, so let's say at the beginning of time quantum, we have one runnable thread. I hope I can answer this question. <laughs> we have one runnable thread at priority zero, three, seven, and nine. What is the longest amount of time before the thread at level nine has a chance to run? Actually, no one's going to be able to answer this question, but I'll show you. It's calculable. That's the point. Right? That was one of the things we liked about the rotating staircase is it has predictable latency. So I can always bound and calculate the amount of time it's going to take before any thread on the staircase gets a chance to run. Right? It's not necessarily true of other. There, there may be a math there here. Is there a math there? Is that what you're about to tell me? Oh, no. Okay, good. I don't know where the number, uh, coefficients are. Yeah, okay. So um, we have one thread that can run at priority 0 through 8. So that's 9 levels, right? For 5 milliseconds. That's the time quantum, right? 
I have a thread at level 3 that can run in 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, so that's 6 levels. And I have a thread 7 that can run in 2 levels, right? Oh. So assuming, and again, this is a bound, right? It's possible that that thread at level 9 can run more quickly. Um, you guys who are, who are confused, make sure you watch the video. Um, yeah. Doesn't that suggest that the quantum is going to refresh every time a thread goes down a level? So shouldn't it actually just be 9 times 5? Because I, each level only has a 5 millisecond quota. So oh, that's true, yeah. Yeah, but the level yeah, doesn't necessarily have but I, I thought it was a. Yeah, ask this on Piazza, and I'll make sure I get it right. Because right. I think there's some confusion in my slides originally. But, but this, m my implementation of RSDL at least has okay. a per thread, per level quantum. But it's possible you write it. That's what we're doing on the test. Yeah, yeah, Bob. <laughs> on, the test, on the test, I'll make sure that I describe this very clearly, right? Talk about something you guys know. All right, so that was sort of a longish review. Any questions about scheduling, though? I just want to make sure that I cover this up. I know it's gone. So any last lingering questions, doubts about thread scheduling? Yeah. Did we ask on the exam whether or not you swore in class as a lecture video comp? That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, that, that question would have to be specific about whether or not it was in person or via proxy. Right? <laughs> and technically, the video wasn't shown in here. So anyway, you can talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Not being able to see like lower, like faster than 27 yeah. refreshes per second. Is there like a specific aim that we should be looking for when we make schedulers? Is there a number that they go by? That's a good question. Um, OK, so yeah, OK, let me, let me try to, that, that's a good point, but let me try to like tease out the distinction between these two things, right? So. Um, the, so if you look at the low-level sort of video drivers, right, they are refreshing your screen at some high rate, like 60 hertz, say, if you have a 60 hertz monitor, right? So there's a couple of panes down there that are switching back and forth quickly between those, right? The process of redrawing the screen, right, so could involve a, a process that takes some indeterminate amount of time, right? But at some point, right, the frame buffer will get redrawn and then swapped out. Right. And that always occurs at the same rate. So the, now, now the problem is, of course, I mean, you, you raise a great point, which is that do schedulers try to determine right, at the point at which you're actually popping something out onto the screen? Right? From the moment that the process of re, you know, calculating what menu you clicked and redrawing the screen buffers and all this happens, like, are there schedulers that actually try to determine it? I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I think my sense would be that's a very, very difficult code path to isolate. Right? simply because it's going to cross over so many libraries and other pieces of junk and the disk and other things, right? Um, but th that's a great question. I don't know the answer to it. Good, good question. Any other questions? More questions that I don't know the answer to. Those are good ones. All right, so, so let's talk about memory, right? One of the biggest differences when we look at memory is that uh, we've been talking about multiplexing, but we haven't been as accurate as we need to be about what we mean to multiplex a resource, right? So, so I want to distinguish between two types of multiplexing, and we need to now because we're going to start talking about memory, right? So one way to share a resource is to divide it up in time, right? So if I have a car that I want to share with you, I can give it to one person on one day and the other person on the other day, right? That's an example of a type of resource that's easy to, to multiplex in time, and that's what's sort of give, given rise to, to car sharing. An example of this in operating systems are CPUs, right? On a single core system, I've got one resource. And even on multi-core systems, the way I'm going to multiplex this resource is not by allowing multiple threads to try to use it at once, right? That doesn't make any sense. I can't divide up the core into two pieces that threads can use simultaneously. There are you know, uh, architectures that provide uh, the illusion of two threads being able to run at the same time, giving a certain set of registers and things like this, and play all these games at the hardware level, but that doesn't really matter, right? From the operating system's perspective, that looks like two execution units, right? How things are multiplexed internally at the hardware level, who cares, right? 
But the point is it makes no sense to talk about trying to take one th uh, core, which can be executing one thread of instructions, and try to divide that in half. Right? That just doesn't make any sense. Um, space multiplexing, on the other hand, is the idea of sharing a resource by dividing it into little pieces. Right? And these resources can be used essentially simultaneously. Right? The, the memory banks on your system are set up in a way that they can be handling lots of different requests at the same time. Right? You can have overlapping requests to memory banks, which are sort of being served by the same underlying, um, underlying <laughs> physical memory chip. Right? And so the way that we're going to approach sharing for memory is, is quite different. And this is probably pretty intuitive to you guys. You know, when you run a program, it doesn't take over the entire memory of, of your machine. Right? It shares the memory with other, with other things. Memory is an example of something that we can actually share with a high degree of granularity. We'll start talking about exactly how granular we can share memory. But you can imagine, you know, with the right support from hardware, we could actually, like, hand out bytes. I could be like, here's your byte, here's your byte, here's your byte. You know, everybody could have a byte, right? I don't know what you're going to do with that byte. It's not that much memory, um, but I could potentially do that, right? So that's an example of something that we can share at a high granularity. On a multi-core system, you can think of CPU scheduling as also having this spatial multiplexing aspect, right? because I have some number of cores. Now, again, the number of bytes of memory I have access to permits sharing at a degree of sort of spatial granularity that's much higher than having eight cores, right? I've got eight cores. I've got eight threads. I've got, you know, four gigabytes of memory. I could divide it up into four gigabyte little pieces, right? And so the, the, the granularity of the spatial multiplexing also matters, right? Um, so let's talk about some some sort of, st uh, you know, bef before we dive into the cool stuff, let's just make sure that we understand why the simple approaches don't work, right? Because we're going to end up building up a lot of machinery to do uh, memory management. By the way, I didn't get to say this, but I love memory management. I think it's so cool. This is my favorite part of the class. So, um, but, you know, why not just divide up physical memory uh, directly, right? I've got a big chunk of RAM, right? And imagine that you know Firefox starts to run. This is a very skinny version of Firefox. Um, <laughs> Firefox Lite. Um, and you know, I, unfortunately, Firefox Lite still needs a bunch of memory, right? Uh, it's not that light. Um, and it starts running, so I just give it some of my physical memory, right? You know, this is my RAM chip, and you can just think of handing over a, a portion of it, right? Um, and then, vir and then my VirtualBox starts to run. Of course, that needs a lot of memory, right? Like VirtualBox. I mean, you guys know how much memory that needs. Um, and now my terminal starts to run, and you know, now I mean, now, but now, uh, you know, my, I give my terminal some memory. But then now, let's say I want to fire up some sort of, uh, you know, uh, broken SVG editing tool called Inkscape, right? Um, it actually works kind of, but um, the the point is that at, at this point, I'm. This is kind of one of the problems with physical allocations. Right, which is when I run out of memory, I really run out of memory. Right? The, this allocation scheme of just handing over direct uh, access to the physical hardware really doesn't leave me anywhere to go when, when I get to the point where I don't have any memory. Wh what do I do at this point? What can I do? Let's say I actually ran this way. And there's actually some smartphones that do this today. Right? When you run out of memory, they blank. Yeah. No, 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 no. You're, that's way sophisticated, right? <laughs> no, no, no. Like, I, I don't have that option. I'm, I'm just out of memory. What do I do? Yeah. Tell you it's not going to do it. Yeah. It just doesn't open the app. It's like, I'm out of memory. Sorry. <laughs> Close some other apps. You know, like, that's, that's it. Yeah. What's that? Doctor will be back in five minutes. Yeah, exactly. Like, why don't you close Firefox? You know, like, that's, but so I could fail this allocation, right? But that's not really that, that elegant. Um, People are already on to you know, where we're going with this, right? Um, so the problems with this approach, right? Again, I hope these are sort of glaringly obvious, right? But the one is that it's limited to the amount of physical memory on the machine. And this may not seem like a problem, OK? Um, but keep in mind, I mean, the amount of memory that you have on your system has always been much, much smaller than the amount of disk. And it's grown quite a bit, but so have your disk sizes, right? It'd be fun. I wish I had like a graph showing the, the uh, ratio between disk size and, and memory size for most machines. But, but it's, it stayed, you know, probably for the last few years at least, it stayed pretty constant, right? You have, hard drives are big, you know? You get machines with like a couple terabytes of, of disk and, you know, 4 GB of RAM, right? So we're talking about, you know, a, a thousand fold difference uh, in the amount of available storage. 
Um, and, and the other problem with being limited, be doing these direct physical allocations, is it provides the operating system with no way to manage the memory that's being used by processes, right? So I have to trust that the process is actually going to use the memory it asks for intelligently. And how much do I trust processes? Not very much, right? Uh, and, and, you know, in, in this case, you know, sometimes processes may want to spread out, right, when they get started, and then later they end up just doing the same thing over and over again or, or whatever. And so uh, the, the, it's not necessarily a process's fault, but I certainly don't want to be locked in to having to allow a particular process to use a chunk of memory simply because I gave it to it and I have no way to manage it, right? Um, so the, the, there's another issue here, right? Which is, let's say that, that I did, okay, so let's say that I did kill Firefox, right? I, you know, I was like, oh, Firefox is using too much memory. I really want to start a Binkscape, so I close Firefox. Now what do I need to do? Do I have enough memory well, it's hard to add these things spatially, but do I have enough memory to run Inkscape? Do I or not? I know, but you guys are making distinctions that I'm not trying to make it. I have enough memory, right? I mean, the user doesn't know this, right? Be like, I'm sorry, you need to free up more contiguous memory. Right? Like, no one's going to know what you mean. So from the user's perspective, I've got enough memory now, right? So it's time to run my Inkscape, you know? I desperately need to edit this SVG document. Um, so, yeah, this non con it, or, or, you know, I, I could try to convince Inkscape to take these two chunks, right? <laughs> no, it's not quite the same as one big chunk, but they're the same size, right? So why don't you figure out how to refactor all your memory allocations to these two random pieces, right? <laughs> yeah, imagine trying to write your apps when every time you ran, you had no idea how much memory you were going to get and what little pieces it was going to come in, right? Maybe you knew how much you were going to get, but not little, little, little pieces, right? Um, and it also means that I have no way of, of growing, right? So let's say the virtual box needs more memory. Of course it does. It always does, right? Um, that's actually probably not true. I think virtual box's memory usage is pretty stable. It just it has a lot, right? Um, but at this point, it can't grow, right? It's hemmed in. Um, and so I, I have these fragmentation problems, right? And we'll come back to exactly what we talk about with fragmentation. But this also might mean that I have to provide these discontiguous allocations. Right. What I'd really like to do, what would be easy for processes to wrap their minds around, is just giving them one big chunk of memory. Right. Uh, but if I try to actually allocate physical memory, there's really no way to do this. Right. And of course, again, as you can imagine, this could be incredibly complicated for how processes lay themselves out. If every time they were trying to run, they were confronted with different amounts of memory in different places. Right. So this is just really not a bad, good idea, and it creates this problem of fragmentation. Right. As processes grow. The uh, amount of memory on the system, you know, I, I might have enough to satisfy an allocation, but not all in one place. Um, and, and again, I mean, th think about this, you know, just to make this more concrete, think about this as from a hypo hypothetical scenario. You, know, I, you, you allocate, this is very simple C code, right? This should work. Um, you allocate a data array, uh, and then you write a value into it, right? But how does your code know what, what a piece of memory to, to write, right? I mean, this, this line, I mean, people who have written C code hopefully have thought a little bit about what happens to the C code after it, you know, leaves the, you know, after it's compiled, but this gets mapped down to some sort of memory instruction that actually has to reference, like, some memory address, right? I have to know where should I put 8. And if every time I run, my data um, array ends up in a different spot, it's going to get really, uh, Really, really tough to do, right? Um, same thing with code, right? Making a function call involves jumping to a specific location and starting to execute code after doing some other stuff, right? And if every time I run, my functions all end up in a different place in memory, this gets very difficult to do, right? So there's ser serious sort of low-level practical problems here. Um, so let's be a little bit more specific about what we talk about when we talk about fragmentation, right? Um, how many people are familiar with this concept? OK, good. Well, I can speed through that, right? So you know, we, we define fragmentation as when a request fails, despite the fact that there's enough memory on the system, enough free or, or we could call unused memory, right? And there's two ways this, this can happen, right? So internal fragmentation happens when the memory that's available is actually inside of things that I've already allocated, 
right? And this can happen because processes aren't using all of their memory allocations, or it can also happen because the amount that I allocated a process wasn't what it asked for, right? So the process asked for seven bytes, and I gave it 128 bytes, right? There is some free memory in there, but I can't free it up to, to satisfy another allocation, right? External fragmentation occurs when the memory that's available that I could use to meet the request is trapped in between existing allocations. This is more what we're used to, right? I've got a bunch of chunks of memory allocated all over, all over my, my, uh, my RAM chip, and there's enough memory in between them to satisfy the request, but if I can't move them, then I may still have to fail that particular memory allocation request. Does this make sense to everybody? Does this match up with what you guys are used to? Okay, good. Um, and, and again, I mean, it's, it's not always, you, you can always think, well, you know, maybe I'll just take my big data structure and try to write it in such a way that I could actually use lots of smaller pieces of memory, but that ends up becoming really, really hard to do, right? Um, you know, does anyone know how C implements these type of, how does C implement arrays? Yeah. Yeah, so when you, when, you out, when you access like data 10, it takes data, which is an address, and it just adds 10 of whatever data are, right? So 10 ints, 10 size of int plus the address of data. That's all that C arrays are, right? And that's why you can do so many stupid broken things with them, right? <laughs> like walk right off the end because the compiler doesn't know. It's like, oh, whatever, you know? <laughs> it wanted the, you know, 2010 and, you know, 20. 20,000th element of data, I'll just give it to it because it's just math to it. Right? It doesn't know what you're trying to do. Um, all right, so the other problem here is, is potentially also pretty obvious. This is also, I, I, I'm sorry I'm beating this horse so much, but I just want to sort of give you guys a sense of how elegant a solution we're about to develop. So um, can I enforce allocations if I'm using, if I'm, if I'm literally just, if all my memory allocation scheme is being able to tell a task, hey, you can use these physical addresses, right? When, it, when a task starts running, I say, here's the start address you can use, here's the end address. Um, is there any way for me to enforce this? I mean, certainly, we certainly haven't talked about one. Doesn't seem like it. You know, why not? You know, I mean, maybe I could use hardware to do this for me, but, but at this point, I don't have, yeah. Well, you have to enforce your allocations, yes, but this scheme has not provided me with any mechanism for doing so. Right. Um, except for potentially checking every memory access, right? Every time you access memory, I could check it, or I could get the hardware to help me, right? And I could have the hardware figure out, is this an OK uh, address for this process to use and, and try to determine, right? Um, can I reclaim unused memory? So again, let's say I give you this big chunk, right? And over time, I can tell that there's large portions of it that you're not using. Is there any way for me to take it back? No, because then you might start using it again, right? And so I, c I can't, you know, because I have no way to intercept your accesses, it's very difficult to reclaim unused memory. I might be able to tell that it's unused, but I really can't do anything about it. And again, this, this leads to this discontinuity problem, right? All right, so hopefully at this point we've sort of developed some design requirements that we'd like to have for memory multiplexing, right? And, and these, we'll talk in a minute about analogies between these and the, what we do with the CPU, right? But I'd like to be able to grant access to memory, right? I clearly need to do that in order to allow tasks to run. They need to use memory, right? And I'd like to do that both statically, right? When the process starts up, it needs a certain amount of memory. Where, where is the initial content? Where do the initial contents of the process come from? Where is the initial layout of the process's memory stored? Does anyone remember? It's like three weeks ago. The elf file, it's like little elves in there that run out to help you set up your address space, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, so, and then dynamically also over time, processes memory needs change, right? So I also want a way to dynamically allocate memory to, to processes or tasks as they need it. Um, I should be able to enforce my memory allocations, and I want to be able to do this efficiently, right? This shouldn't slow down the system to a great degree, but I need to make sure that I can provide tasks with private memory, right? The memory should be private to that task, and a task should be able to just write over another process's memory, right? I'd like to be able to reclaim unused memory, and when I do that, 
it's important that the process not know, right? If I took your memory and I gave it back to you with a bunch of new stuff in it, you would probably notice, right? And that probably would cause you to do something bad like crash, right? So if I'm going to take some of your memory away because I doesn't seem like you're using it, I need to make sure that I preserve the contents. And finally, I need to actually be able to revoke allocations as well. So just because I've been able, I've told you that you can use this memory doesn't mean I'm going to allow you to use it forever. At some point in the future, I may uh, want to stop you from using that memory, right? So what are the, what are these sort of, uh, analogies here with our CBU. So we've just finished the CBU unit. This is good review. What's the granting memory to a process? Is, well, what do, what's the mechanism we use to grant the CBU? Schedule, Schedule a thread, right? I use a context switch to sort of uh, reclaim the resource, and then I, I grant it to the, to the process, right? What about enforcing? Is there an analogy here? Yeah, so I can enforce my allocations. I've only given you a certain amount of time to run on the CPU. And to make sure that you don't run longer than I wanted, remember I'm time multiplexing this resource, not spatially, I have a timer that fires to make sure that I get a chance to run and take the resource away if you've used it as long as I want you to. Right? What about reclaim? Is there a good analogy for this one? Not really. It's not really the equivalent of, of being able to reclaim memory. When I take the CPU away from a process, I mean, it's sort of like a context switch, but, but it's a little bit more direct. And then revoke is, you know, descheduling, right? So when, when you're finished, I can take the resource away from you and provide it to somebody else, right? So remember when we talked about the CPU, we had the thread abstraction, right? And it had some nice properties. In memory, we're actually, the abstraction is even more powerful, right? And the abstraction has all of these neat properties that gives us everything that we want, OK? And then the only problem is we actually have to figure out how to get it to work, right? <laughs> so with, with the threads and the CPU, there's a little bit more of a direct mapping there. And it wasn't, it wasn't as complicated to actually get threads to work. Address spaces are kind of like, let's do this awesome thing. And then someone sat around scratching their head being like, but how do we do that, right? OK, so the fun thing about address spaces, these are the nice properties, right? I can provide every process or task with an identical view of memory, right? That view of memory makes it look plentiful. For example, I have a four gigabyte address space that's all mine, right? That looks like it's all for me, okay? It's contiguous, <laughs> right? There are no holes in it. There's no little gaps that I can't use. I can use any address within that space, right? Um, it's uniform. Every time I run, I get the same thing. You know? I don't get you know, a 2 gigabyte one one day and a 4 gigabyte the next one, and one that has a hole in it or starts at a different address or whatever. It always looks the same. Okay? And that simplifies a lot of things about how processes operate, as you would expect. And it's mine. It's private to my process. Right? Um, so, so clearly, there's all sorts of challenges to implementing this. Right? Um, if, if you can imagine. So for example, What's one challenge of providing a four gigabyte address space to every process on the machine? I might not even have four gigabytes of memory total on my machine, right? So this is a little bit of like a Hail Mary pass, right? <laughs> um, you know, and, and what about making it look contiguous, right? Same thing. Like, how do I, I don't even have four GB, I can't even, I can't even make it look complete, right? Much less contiguous, right? Um, the, the same every time, that sort of comes along with things, but, but that requires, uh, obviously, what does this require, right? Making it look the same every time, what, what, what's, what, what weird thing have I just introduced? If a process runs once and says, I want memory address 10, and then runs again and expects to be able to say the same thing, despite the fact there are other processes running, what does that mean about the addresses that I'm providing to these processes? Yeah. Yeah, because there's a bunch of processes that think they're using address 10, you know? Including maybe multiple copies of me if I called fork or whatever, right? So, so that breaks some sort of fundamental mapping between addresses and the underlying abstraction, right? And finally, you know, making sure it's private, you know, simply requires, you know, enforcing that, right? And making sure that this happens, okay? As you can imagine, again, the uniformity of address space, I just want you to appreciate some of these properties, right? So this makes process layout really simple, 
right? Every time a process runs, it says, I put my code in a particular place, right? This is what's in the ELF file, right? The ELF file says, I put my code in static variables right here, right? And then my heap starts at this point, and that's where I allocate my dynamic content, and the stack of my thread always starts here and grows down. It's really, really nice, right? And you can imagine, again, this makes process layout very, very simple. Yeah, why James. Is, why is there always such a big gap between the heap and the code section? The heap and the code, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. No one needs that much heap. Come on. There's only like 2 GB in there that you can get at. That's, I, it, maybe there's, well, I don't know. I don't know if there is a huge gap here. I might have just, the heap can actually start, in, in some systems, the heap actually starts right on the top of the code, right? So this is, you know, this is for dramatic effect, right? Um, the, um, so, so again, ELF, right? So, so this is a good question, right? They're, they're, so, so layout is, is determined by the ELF file. The ELF file, again, contains this blueprint of what the process address space is supposed to look like. We talked about that three weeks ago. You didn't know what an address space was. Now you do. Um, but here's a, here's a great question. Why not load, some people know this, but I, I don't want to answer it too fast. Why not load the code at zero, right? So by convention, the code is not loaded at zero. And zero is used for something else. Um, but why not load the code at zero? I mean, if I loaded the code at zero, I would have more space for my heap because I could put the heap way down there and I'd have more memory. So why not load the code at zero? Yeah. Room for the language itself? Room for the language? No, there's nothing down there at zero. Yeah. Nope. Processes contain no such instructions. Those are loaded in other places. Yeah, Damien. There is nothing down there, nothing. So the question is, why is there nothing down there, rather than what's down there? Because there's in anything. Yeah. Yeah. So how many people have, have ever generated a segmentation fault? <laughs> That's yeah. I mean that that is what happens, right? The reason I don't load code down at zero, and in fact I leave a large swath of memory unallocated, is to catch null pointer exceptions, right? Because if you, so if you did a read from null on a system that actually had code down here, you would just get some stuff, right? Like you would get some bytes of your code segment that probably would be garbage, right? But it's much better when you start breaking things and having uh, pointers, dangling pointers, to find out immediately, right? So we leave a big chunk of, uh, of address space starting at zero, and that's essentially what generates these segmentation faults. That's a very, we'll, we'll, you will understand exactly what this means in a week or so, right? Exactly what the segmentation fault means. Core dumped, eh, who knows, right? Uh, but the uh, segmentation, we know what we're doing. So is like, that memory clear, or is it like, filled with like... So that memory is, is set up so the process is not allowed to access it, right? And we'll get back to that too, right? So an access to that memory causes the kernel to realize that the process has done something bad and is misbehaving and causes that process to be killed. Right. That's that's what generates this this error, right? Um, so it, you know, as James pointed out, the stack normally is set up at the top of my address space, and stack the stack by convention grows downward as I make function calls or allocate variables. My stack goes this way, my heap goes that way. How many people have ever had a problem with the stack going this way? What what kind of uh, what kind of code can cause the stack to go this way? Maybe more than it should. Yeah. Yeah, how many people have ever written a recursive function that didn't have a base case? <laughs> yeah, so that one just goes, zoop, and then usually what happens is it actually doesn't get anywhere close to down here. Usually there's a limit on how much your stack can grow that's set on the system that you're running at. When you hit that, it dies, right? And, uh, but that's a good way to cause it. Um, the heap, which is where, what, what goes in the heap? How do you get access to the heap? Malloc. So malloc is what man is normally the library used to manage this heap area. Malloc dynamically allocates within this area, and when it needs more memory, it goes up. Uh, in order for these two to meet, that would mean that either your stack or heap would be very large, right? Like two gigabytes, and this doesn't usually happen. Yeah. Global variables. Where are where is data? So so you know to to, to first approximation. Everything within this diagram, this is dynamically allocated by malloc. 
This is implicitly dynamically allocated by you, by your code, as it makes function calls and allocates local variables. Uh, where are your global variables? Yeah. Yeah, so they're actually, the, the ELF file actually sets up space for those global variables, right? If it's a global variable, I know about it when I compile the code, and I can create space for it, right? And there's actually two, and remember if you, you remember when we looked at the PMAP output, there's actually two types. There's some global variables that are initialized to zero, and there's other global variables that actually have their initializers within the ELF file, right? So if you set up a global variable without initializing it, it goes in one, potentially in one region. If you initialize it with the value, it gets put in another. Good question. So, um, so yeah. So this this makes things again, at least with relocation, pretty nice, right? Um, there's one one little uh, hiccup here, which is dynamically loaded libraries, right? And these, because their size can change, and because the order in which they're loaded can change, these are actually allocated at runtime, and it's not something we're going to cover, right? Okay. <coughs> so the address space abstraction sounds awesome, right? The big question we're going to cover for the next couple of weeks is, can we implement this thing, right? This would be a nice thing to have, um, and on Wednesday we'll start talking about what we need in order to make this real.